All right. Welcome to City Council Committee meeting for Monday the 8th. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Karen Stratton, Chair of the Urban Experience Committee. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we start, I wanted to let everybody know that my family has noted that I'm getting my sense of humor back. So we will start with my March. We will start with a March joke. See if you can answer it. What do you call a parade of rabbits hopping backwards? Uh. Nobody. The answer is a receding hairline. Uh. Okay. No big laughs on that one, but I liked it. I'm starting to feel like myself again. Oh, Danielle left. That's good. Okay, so I need to get an approval of the minutes. If y'all had a chance to look at them for February 8th, 2020. I have a I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. We've got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. Opposed? aye. Okay. Motion or the minutes have been approved. If you look under consent items, does anybody have questions? A through F of anything on that list. No? Okay, we'll move to discussion items. The first A, B, and C under staff requests, that is going to be presented by David Payne, Nathan Grow, and I think Tanya Wallace. If you're, you're here, go ahead and take over A, B, and C. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, David Payne is in absence today due to a family emergency. Um, so we are here to discuss the vehicle purchases slash leases of Chris Becker's departments. As well, before sharing my screen, I'd like to go over what Fleet has been working on towards RCW and WAC compliance to get us to this point. Uh, just as a reminder, we have the Parks, Depi Parks Department uh, lease pilot for trucks. Um, we have also joined the AVTAG group and participate in bi-monthly meetings with them in the Department of Commerce regarding electric vehicles in local governments here in Washington. Um, we've also reviewed uh, plenty of plans uh, like the Seattle Green Fleet Plan and the Cultura Assessment we are currently underway with right-sizing efforts for all departments. As you know, we have the SPD K8 hybrid pilot. Um, we also accepted grant dollars from the Volkswagen settlement grant to expand EDSEs at fleet services by adding six dual plug chargers. And of course, more, most recently is the SRTC grant. So diving into the topic, let me share my screen here. Okay. So going, looking over vehicle replacement and acquisition strategy for Chris Becker's groups of development service center, code enforcement and parking services. Ms. Wallace, if you would like to go over the outline and the slide after this, please go ahead. Hi, City Council. Um, Nathan has prepared a really great presentation um, for you. This is an expansion of the leasing program um, that we started with the Parks Department really about two years ago, almost three years ago. Um, so we do want to quickly review the leasing opportunity. We also previously uh, spoke to you about it, I want to say like August, September. Um, and then we're going to cover the, the vehicles that are to be replaced and why we're replacing them, particularly with a lease, and review the options that are available. Nathan's done some really good work at looking at the different options to select from. And this is a unique year with COVID, certainly from the manufacturers. The supply chain has been interrupted. So it's just a lot of nuances that COVID has presented itself. And then, of course, review the total cost of ownership analysis with this vehicle choice. So moving on and talking about the leasing opportunity, 
First and foremost, I want to um, emphasize that this provides our greatest flexibility as we look at transforming our fleet. Um, normally, we hang on to vehicles and we hang on to them until they're sometimes 10 or 20 years old. But with leasing, we have the option right now with returning that every year. Enterprise is going to evaluate the marketability of that vehicle, and we can turn it back. So it gives us that great flexibility as we start to transform our fleet to move a little faster than if we did a purchase of these vehicles. Um, and it also allows us to be nimble as we start to put in these charging infrastructures. Certainly the infrastructure um, for our charging stations is going to be a rolling strategy. And now this will provide that flexibility so we're completely able to address as we get charging stations on, we can also move more fully into the electric fleet uh, requirements. Um, able to acquire and use vehicles that are more gas efficient and higher safety features. So even if uh, an electric vehicle is not available, this option allows us to at least procure or obtain the use of something that is more gas efficient and certainly has more safety features available than something that is 10 or 20 years old, as you're going to see uh, presented here shortly. Um, standardizes and brands the fleet so that city staff are recognizable when conducting city business. This is especially true in this case when you're going to see a recommendation to replace 10 vehicles that are the employee's own vehicle, not it was their personal vehicle that they're using. So this promotes the city and standardizes that. It also lowers our overall maintenance cost of the fleet since the average fleet is reduced. So if we can turn vehicles over, if it's right for the market, and in today's market, again, certain vehicles, if this is just a smart decision, um, our overall maintenance of these vehicles is going to go down pretty dramatically. And then lastly, you heard from parks. It definitely enhances that employee morale. One other point that I want to make because, um, and we missed it on here, but this leasing opportunity actually supports our local vendors, our local dealers. They get a piece of this pie where on the state contract for procurement, they would not get a piece of the pie. When we buy off the state contract, most of those dealers are on the other side of the Cascade Mountains, and then they get shipped here. But with Enterprise, which came from a competitive RFP process in a national consortium, they actually contract with local dealers to do the unwrapping and prepping of the vehicle when it arrives from the manufacturer. So our local dealers are getting an opportunity to participate um, and get paid for those services that they do. So with that, Council, are there any questions here before we proceed into the nuts and bolts of this specific request? Okay. I just have a quick question, um, and I'm assuming we're going to cover this. When we look at the, the Toyota RAV and Tacomas and, you know, the specifics, so are those going to be more gas efficient with higher safety standards? Great question, uh, Council Member Stratton, and I think Nathan is going to cover some of those details. Okay. So I'll great. let him get into it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Yes, Council Member Stratton, this is Lori. Well, go ahead, Lori. What's the what's the rationale for for using hybrids rather than just going right to electric vehicles. We know we can get the charging stations up really quickly. So what's the rationale to do? I mean, they're gas efficient, still gas. So why are we talking about gas vehicles when we should be talking about electric? Um, I think Jason can cover some of those options when he shows you the list of the options that he looked that were considered. Yeah, and if I can if I can jump in really quickly there, um, you are right. We do have the ability to get charging stations up. I, I think the main point right now is at this moment in time, we don't have the charging capabilities for the 
electric vehicles, which is why it was decided to lease the next best option being a very fuel efficient hybrid vehicle that still meets the operational needs of the department. So could I ask a follow up question, Council Member Stratton? Go for it. That's a chicken and an egg thing. And Avista has told us that they can get a charging, charging station up really quickly. If we're saying we need the charging stations first, then we're never going to get there. Avista will, as soon as we purchase or lease, they'll start putting in charging stations. So I'm a little frustrated by this logic because it seems circular to me. And we can get the charging stations, we just have to order the vehicles. So that's going to be my pitch. Um, Council Member Kinnear, I completely hear you. Um, we actually have a meeting that has been scheduled on the books with a VISTA at the end of April. And part of the reason for the end of April is so that both the new facility and fleet director can participate in that and help us identify how many stations we're going to need, where they're going to be optimally located for city use, and some of the finer details um, that we really do need to plan out. And um, so that we are putting, I mean, we don't, for example, we don't want to put a charging station in a location where we don't have vehicles or where employees can't access that. So we do have to have a little bit of um, strategic mapping for these stations, um, but the process is getting started. And, and so again, sorry, Council Member Stratton, we have a, we have a place to park our um, parking enforcement vehicles. We, that's by the intermodal. So that's already in place. And is there any way we can wait? Do we have to do this now? Let's wait for the meeting with a VISTA so that we have a plan in place going forward rather than doing this and then meeting with the VIS. It just seems backward to me. Um, it, it, oh, go ahead. So Councilman works here. So if we are leasing these vehicles to Council Member Kinnear's point after the meeting, so we would have the ability to then let the hybrids go in year two and go all EV. I mean, we're saying that's the perk of the lease. We can upgrade, change out. So somebody could speak to that for me. Yes, um, the, the contracts, actually what Enterprise does on an annual basis is they look at those leases and they give us an opportunity to determine if it's, if it's a good time to turn those vehicles in. And we can turn those vehicles in any time before the end of the lease term. Um, in fact, they did this for the parks operations and they had actually recommended that we return those vehicles in a year earlier because of what was happening in the market. So yes, the second year into this, a year from now, or closer, uh, probably in the fall of 2021, is when Enterprise would be coming back with an assessment of these vehicles. And we could, at that time, turn these vehicles back in. And if there's electric vehicles um, available, we could place the order for those at that time. What, I have one more question, sorry. I don't mean to beat this to death. What's the term of the lease? Is it how? When? What's the what's the bake time for this lease? Great question. These are five year leases, but every year we get to review them. So theoretically, we could end up with a five year a vehicle for five years. We could. Okay. If we were to buy them, we'd hang on to them until they die, to for about ten to twenty years, which you can see here. For example, we have a Ford Escort that is 1997. And I, I'm not debating the lease versus buy. I'm debating hybrid versus. Mm -hmm. And if I can jump in really quickly, um, while we haven't gotten the specifics yet, we are waiting on Enterprise to provide us a list of battery electric vehicles that we would be able to lease from them that is in discussions right now as well. 
So Nathan, if you want to continue on with your presentation, let's go ahead and hopefully we'll have a hopefully we'll have a couple minutes at the end to ask any additional questions and um, figure out some follow up from here. So go ahead. Of course. Yeah, so this slide has been up for a minute now, so you can see essentially what we are replacing and what replacement option has been chosen. Uh, you'll note at the bottom that 10 additional RAV4 hybrids um, are up to replace employee-owned personal vehicles currently being used. Going over the vehicle replacement options that we currently have from enterprise leasing services, not including the battery electric vehicles that they have yet to get to us. Um, you can see we have a wide range of options in regards to compact sedans, small SUVs, et cetera. The, there is the Escape plug-in hybrid, uh, which costs you know, just about $100 more per month uh, for that lease as well. But this just gives you an idea of the lease options that we currently have from Enterprise in regards to mid-size SUV and smaller size vehicles. Moving on to the actual analysis itself. So you know that, um, you know, why don't we go with a battery electric vehicle? You can see here, um, this is the Atlas Public Policy Total Cost of Ownership Calculator that is approved by the- Hey, um, sorry, Nathan, but I think someone's not on mute. So you can check to see if you're on mute or not. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. In this uh, in this analysis, I would like to note that while it is uh, designated by one of the WACs, charging infrastructure at the request of council was not included in this uh, in this total cost of ownership analysis. So the charging infrastructure for the Nissan Leaf and the Ford Mustang Mach E was not included uh, in this price you see at the bottom. Of course, you can see that the Nissan LEAF over a period of 10 years um, for the same mileage that the GO4s were racking up per year was about $500 cheaper over the life cycle of that vehicle than the Toyota RAV4 hybrid. And for the personal vehicle replacements, you'll note the same exact trend with the Nissan LEAF being uh, just under the life cycle cost of the RAV4 hybrid, uh, but significantly cheaper than uh, another battery electric vehicle alternative being the Ford Mustang Mach-E. And that vehicle was chosen as a comparison because of its comparison in size to the Toyota RAV4 hybrid in terms of cargo space and all-wheel drive capability. The Nissan LEAF, of course, does not have any four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive capability, but it might be argued that with a good set of winter tires, you could do just about the same as an all-wheel drive vehicle. So that gives you an idea of what the life cycle costs were for these um, two different types of replacements. The personal vehicle replacements were calculated at an average mileage of 7,500 miles per year, and the go-4s at a mileage of 3,500 miles per year. That concludes my presentation, does anyone have any questions or would like for me to refer back to any of the previous slides? Council President. Yep. So, Nathan, I'm sure you're very familiar with RCW 43-19-648. And the way I read it is that after 2018, we have to go with the lower uh, cost vehicle over its lifetime uh, unless we council makes some finding that it's not practicable and so i'm just if you're just reading that law straight up wouldn't wouldn't you agree that it would probably for for this use we would be in the battery vehicle world based on your analysis yeah so i, I would agree uh, I, I would agree with the as long as it's one percent less than the cost of the replacement that we would normally go with 100 percent choose the electric vehicle. I think something that really needs to be discussed essentially is whether or not to 
include the cost of charging infrastructure. Uh, Council President, I do not know if you have had any communication with Department of Commerce on this. I have tried to get in touch with them myself to no avail of whether to include those costs in the life cycle cost analysis, uh, just because we know that that can sway the direction either way. But you are right. According to the life cycle cost analysis and the RCW, if the battery electric vehicle costs less, then you should choose the battery electric vehicle. Right. And just a comment on the charging. The reason I don't include it is because you have to put the charging infrastructure in uh, one time, and it then can serve multiple vehicles. So you wouldn't do it, you know, one charger, one vehicle over the lifetime of the charger you you might figure out how long a charger would last how many vehicles it would serve over its useful lifetime and you know i could imagine that these particular charging stations are coming to us at low or no cost so i don't know that it actually matters but um but that's how i view it is that you don't you don't charge your first car with a first charging station you look at the whole total cost of charging stations, just like if we put in a gasoline pump for um, our police vehicles, that's, you know, that's part of the cost, but it's spread out over hundreds of vehicles over decades. Right. And I do agree with you. I will say that on that note, if you don't mind, best management practices is usually to have um, one, one charger for every one to three battery electric vehicles. And my personal hiccup with the cost of the charging stations and the life cycle cost analysis is I agree with you. I get hung up, however, on WAC 194.29.020 states that the life cycle cost means uh, the total cost of ownership over the life of an asset, including the incremental cost of associated refueling infrastructure. Um, so I think it comes up down to that interpretation of the WAC. And just to let the council president beg, that's where I get hung up on. Sure. And I, I had one other. Oh, I just had one follow-up, and I'm just wondering, one of these vehicles, or some of them, are Toyota Tacomas instead of RAV4s, and I'm just wondering what is it about the use of those vehicles that needed the bigger vehicle, if anyone knows. Hi, it's Chris Becker. Um, We have one uh, Ford Ranger in code enforcement that we're replacing, and that's for our graffiti program. So they're carrying um, cans of paint and equipment to paint graffiti. Thanks. Council Member Fair. So it's my understanding that we got a 2.5 million grant for charging infrastructure. Is that correct? Can anybody confirm that? Yes, no. Um, and if that's the case, it's actually five million dollars because Avista sorry, matched what? it. It's five million because Avista matched the 2.5 million okay. grant with another 2.5 million. So it, it seems to me infrastructure is a moot point. I, I'm not even. I'm wondering why we are even having this discussion about infrastructure when we have that grant and then a VISTA's matching. Um, can I just ask for a, a clarification on that grant, um, Council Member Kinnear or uh, Council President Beggs? Is that the SRTC grant? I'm not aware of a city, of the city yeah. having a grant for no, that. We, yeah, we applied for it with I'm still, SRTC. I'm still learning things. Yeah, we applied for it with SRTC. So, yeah. so it sounds to me like we probably need more discussion. We have more questions. So, um, Nate. Councilman Stratton, can I ask one quick yes. question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so, so my question is just regarding the cost. It just seems pretty excessively high. I think it was 500 a month that we were looking at. And if you just kind of go browse Toyota's website right now, I mean, they're listing 239 for lease price for a hybrid. So I'm just, I'm just kind of curious why these particular models, why, why these price points?
Um, that that would I'm not familiar with what you you're looking at, um, Councilmember Cathcart. We can certainly compare that. Um, these are the bid prices from the manufacturer according to um, you know governmental uh, purchasing. So I mean, and we would gladly take a look at that and, and get an answer back to you. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So why don't we do this? Why don't we? Um, we know what the questions are, and um, Nathan and Tanya, maybe we can get together and see if you want to do another presentation to help answer some of these questions and provide inform more information on the electric cars that might be available. Um, and maybe we do that at a study session, or I don't know how long we can wait, but let's talk in the next couple of days and see how we want to move forward to get some of these questions answered. And I would encourage everybody with questions to go ahead and send them along to Nathan or Tanya and so they know they can get a complete um, reflection of what people's concerns were. Councilmember Wilkerson. Well, I was just going to say, will we really have any answers to after the ABISTA meeting? So. And that's at the end of April. Is there any way that meeting could be looped up or is that um, it, it can certainly be moved up, but it would be absent the two new directors that I think would be very, very critically involved in um, outlining what the future plan is and where the infrastructure is going to be in the city facilities. So if any decision to purchase these vehicles was, um, Lori, help me out here. What's the word I want? Delayed until that meeting? we could do that is would that is that appropriate that we would have that time if people are uncomfortable making a decision um we would have to get back to the city council there are manufacturer deadlines we may miss those deadlines if it's deferred until um may or later okay would be my fear so why so don't we can look into that Yep, we can stay in touch with each other and see what direction we want to go, but it sounds to me like there's still enough questions that we uh, will need to meet again and talk about it. Most definitely. All right, we're going to move along. Thank you so much for that um, informative presentation. We are going to move to, uh, let's see, Marin Murphy is going to talk about Fifth Avenue. Great, thank you all. Is this going on my end? Uh, my name is Marin Murphy, and I'm a planner with the city. Um, and today I am going to uh, share about the Fifth Avenue Initiative and the draft community strategy. Uh, the Fifth Avenue Initiative is a neighborhood-driven effort in partnership with the city to reimagine East Fifth Avenue in the East Central neighborhood. And the outcome has been a community strategy that provides actions for improvement programming and community community building for both citizens and businesses along the Fifth Avenue corridor. So this is just an overview map of the area uh, focused on, along Fifth Avenue from Liberty Park to Thor Freya, and then also filtering out into the surrounding area from the freeway to the bluff. And as part of one of the oldest neighborhoods in Spokane and East Central, the area is also one of the most uh, racially and ethnic, ethnically diverse areas. And stakeholders identified this as a strength and important part of the legacy and identity. There is also a history of inequality in this area, including um, discriminatory housing practices like redlining in the 30s, and then the I-90 freeway uh, was built through the neighborhood in the 1950s. And so this has added to conditions of economic, um, economic challenges and disinvestment over decades. But the community, um, has continued to fight for the livelihood of the neighborhood and the residents. And in the 70s, the League of Women for Community Action planned and fundraised for the East Central Community Center, which was the first center to open in the city. And many other um, community centers opened after that. And I share this history because it's important to provide the backdrop for many of the challenges that the area continues to face, but also to speak to the resilience and commitment of the Fifth Avenue community to reimagine the area. And it's also part of the reason why this initiative came about as one way to address the inequities and impacts caused over time. 
So today, um, residents, businesses, nonprofits in the area, churches have been working hard together to enhance the Fifth Avenue as a catalyst for a renewed vision in the Central. And there's been a lot of progress already. Uh, the, the area today is rich in civic and institutional organizations, faith-based organizations, and community services that support both residents and the larger area. There's also a variety of parks and trails and natural features. And there are longstanding businesses in addition to new businesses moving in. And in recent years, the city has invested in sidewalk improvements, planting new street trees along Fifth Avenue. But the community uh, throughout the course of this project has advocated for continued attention on, on Fifth Avenue by the city, um, continued partnership to help achieve uh, the reimagining and the revitalization of the area. And I just wanted to share a few upcoming opportunities that are um, ongoing. The development of the pedestrian bike trail along the North Spokane corridor called the Children of the Sun Trail will connect to the Ben Burr Trail in East Central. And the Washington Department of Transportation has been really involved in the discussion so far. They have a lot of their own place meeting activities that have been going on. The, um, the project with SRTC and Avista uh, with the charging stations, uh, they're looking at uh, putting one in, in the Fifth Avenue area as well. And then, of course, the East Central Library is being relocated and a new library being built in uh, Liberty Park. And that is going on right now, which will include a children's zone programming space, and it'll be double the, the size, I think. So uh, part of that focus of the project has also been to bring these opportunities together and promote community engagement to help leverage uh, that into additional revitalization. So from the beginning, the Fifth Avenue Initiative really focused on inclusion and reflecting the diversity of the community. And the process builds on previous engagements uh, over the last five years. We re-engaged the community in 2019 with a small project team and hosted three stakeholder meetings and two community forums from late 2019 to early 2020. And we had just developed the draft strategy in February 2020, right before the pandemic started, um, put a pause to many things, uh, but the, the community continued to advocate for the project uh, reaching completion as far as the draft community strategy. And so the focus now is to adopt the strategy and recognize the community's efforts and priorities for the area. And I just want to acknowledge the many stakeholders who attended meetings and participated in the discussions, um, including our recent project team. We did work with a community liaison to help facilitate the conversations, which was a really great uh, partnership. And we deeply appreciate everyone's time and energy uh, as focusing on the Fifth Avenue Initiative. And so we do have a community strategy um, that I, I mentioned, and it's envisioning Fifth Avenue to be an area of, of opportunity for current residents and future residents, as well as an inviting place for people all over the city to come and visit. And the plan is, or the strategy is um, short and concise, but does have six overarching priorities and then a number of um, focus areas within that. So those priorities speak to defining the Fifth Avenue identity further, promoting coordination, improving the streetscape, uh, preserving and expanding housing affordability and uh, minimizing displacement for current residents and promoting neighborhood commercial opportunities and protecting and enhancing parks and trails in that area. So we hosted a workshop and public hearing with the plan commission in February. And um, from that, we added some additional context in the strategy on um, some history in the area, as well as references to supporting arts, culture, and expression, uh, some more uh, focus around housing, and also mentions of environmental justice. And discussions at the Plan Commission really expressed support for the process and the strategy, and um, wanting to see it move forward, and um, helping advance the revitalization work in partnership with the community. So hopefully our next steps after this will be to move to city council for adoption by resolution. And then, as I mentioned, the community is very hopeful that there will be ongoing emphasis on implementation of the priorities and action. So that's the quick overview and happy to have any questions or discussion. 
I can go back to anything as well. I, Maren, I'm Councilor. Yeah, I'm curious. What are the strategies for increasing commercial opportunities and uh, also for preventing displacement? Okay. Um, yeah, so, hold on, let me just grab the plan. Uh, so the, the commercial opportunities, there is a small neighborhood commercial or neighborhood retail area. And so a lot of discussion around that was trying to maximize that um, as much as possible because the, our current comp plan policy limits neighborhood retail to the current footprint. So how can the community maximize what's there? There was some long-term talk of we looking at zoning or land use as one focus. Um, and then there, are, since the project has been going, there were some vacancies that um, businesses did move in. So we're, again, we're starting to see um, more activity along that small commercial area. Um, and then as far as housing, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the housing action plan. And so a lot of those early discussions with this group are kind of re reflective of um, what the housing action plan is talking about as well. And so wanting to maintain affordability, support current residents. Uh, there was talk at the plan commission of how maybe that area could help support student housing with nearby universities. Um, so the as far as anti-displacement strategies, I think it's, it's pretty broad right now. Um, and certainly the housing action plan could provide more guidance on that, but just recognizing that the uh, history of the area and the, um, the discriminatory policies in the past, trying to maintain the current residents and um, trying to create a space for them uh, as, as development goes forward. Any other comments or questions? Council Member Kinnear. Hey, Martin. Uh, Thanks. Oh. Uh, then Maren. Council Member Cap. Thanks. Maren, has, is there any talk of doing or is it appropriate to consider an overlay for that is the existing business and expanding it a little bit so that what's there is great, but then they have an opportunity to grow. Has that been considered at all? Um, not, not maybe in an overlay sense, but um, there has been talk and even again, referencing back to the housing action plan of just how can you support um, expanded neighborhood commercial opportunities. So um, that would, yeah, I don't have a, a great answer to that um, as far as an overlay, but just trying to address uh, the zoning and, and trying to expand that if, if possible to see more vibrancy there. Councilman Katkar, can I jump in and just answer Lori's question before you speak? So Council Member Kinnear, uh, thank you for that question. So the challenge has been with this neighborhood is just the resources to actually imagine what that is. When these neighbors came together uh, without city support, they didn't know what an overlay or a sub area planning was or is going forward and really how to develop that neighborhood. So the city's partnership has been critical in visioning and helping to support that. And also the education piece because of a lack of a lot of business down there. Those conversations have never happened. And I will speak to myself. I was not as knowledgeable either about an overlay. And so once that was introduced to the conversation, now the neighborhood is starting to understand and excited about the possibility of our overlay or the sub area planning process. Council Member Capart. Yeah, he, uh, Martin, I'm, I'm curious, um, and, and also just I, I think there's a lot of really cool options that, that could be uh, implemented in, in this area. My, my curiosity is in terms of the, the identity uh, uh, piece that you put up there. When you say that, are you talking about branding kind of this area? And I'm wondering just in big picture, how, how is that woven into sort of the, the neighborhood 
uh, identity or the, the, the entire neighborhood's uh, current branding. I'm just kind of curious how all of that will mesh together as this evolves. Yeah, thank you, Council. Oh, Councilmember, uh, do you want to take Maren, that one? <laughs> please answer, Maren, but I will tell you, Councilmember Kat Cart, like East Central is looking, it is a branding and creating gateways into East Central when you enter the neighborhood as coming off the Binbird Trail down by Liberty Park or when you take the Altamont exit uh, that you're actually in East Central. And what does that look like when you're down by the Fred Meyer area that you are actually in the East Central neighborhood? So yes, identifying location and branding. Yeah, and I could just add that um, the just the recognition that the East Central neighborhood is very big, um, you know, goes north of the freeway and south of the freeway, and there are um, kind of sub areas within there, um, you know, the East Sprague Business District and South Perry. So there was discussion the stakeholders were talking about, you know, what would a Fifth Avenue um, kind of focus look like, and how can how can stakeholders along Fifth Avenue better organize so that there's more of a, a concerted voice for that area within within broader East Central conversations, much like East Sprague and South Perry has. So, Council Member Cat uh, Cart, our challenge East Central, the neighborhood feels like it's been peeled off, as Lauren said. So, Perry District kind of peeled off from East Central. And then you have the East Bragg Business District that's kind of come and carved out. And now part of the U District has come into East Central and is carved out. So East Central, what people think of, is now being parceled uh, to these different identifying entities. And so there's no East Central because these other neighborhoods identify themselves differently. I had a question for you, Councilmember Wilkerson. If you were if you were trying to decide the boundaries of East Central the way you think the neighborhood would most want to, what what how would you describe that to us? Because I'm I'm cognizant that there is Sprague and that's where the business a lot of the business value is. And if we're talking at some point about a tax increment financing, I'm interested. How far would you draw the boundaries? If I hear it would be north of the freeway, but what how would you describe just in your thinking. So certainly on the south side, it'd be the bluff at Underhill Park coming down. Actually, I would go to Havana and that's just a little bit past Sheridan Elementary School uh, where the washed out land is to be developed, hopefully to be developed for housing. We would take it down to Liberty Park. So that's the east west boundaries. And then I would go over at least to the Sprague area uh, to be inclusive of East Central. Uh, that, that would be the footprint uh, that seems the most natural for, for most of the community over there. Great, thanks. Okay, this has been a good discussion um, and a great update. Marin, thank you for all your hard work. And I know we'll be hearing from you again regarding this. So thanks for joining us today. Lewis Mueller is going to give us an update on the uh, Plan Commission work program. Yeah, in your packet today, there is a kind of the current draft of what the Plan Commission and, and Council from time to time have been uh, giving input on for this year. Uh, the Plan Commission is, has this as another major agenda item this Wednesday. Um, hopefully, we will get a recommendation from them, uh, a kind of a final recommendation that will come back to you. Uh, it is still being worked on. There is a housing placeholder item of a subject. So we have a, an accessory dwelling unit line item in there. Uh, that as being a project, it's in council's 100 day plan and been an interest of the plan commission also. Um, but I wanted to get some input on what, what other housing item would be a priority from council as a whole. There's been discussions on the plan commission about re-examining exclusiveness of single family zoning throughout the city. There's been discussion about transition housing from centers and corridors and focusing on existing centers and corridors um, for housing opportunities. I just had, wanted to take a couple minutes to have from all of you to give feedback for this Wednesday. 
Council Member Kinnear. I know I'm probably talking too much today and I've only had one cup of tea, so I apologize. I would like to see some emphasis put on the missing middle. We talk about um, affordable housing, low income housing. There's a whole group of people who are living in apartments right now that would like to be able to own a home, but they can't afford a $300,000 home or a $250,000 home. So I would like to talk about the missing middle and how we can get those folks into housing that they own. Lewis, this is not the question you asked, but I'm just sharing my sentiments. So I can change the struggle with how can we drive development within the city core, uh, vacant lots. I, mean, I appreciate uh, housing complexes that are 130 units, but that's not going to fit right in the city core. What about development of maybe 25 units uh, apartment complexes or duplexes or condos? So it seems the growth, once again, is on the periphery of the city, and it's not going towards uh, the infill that I think that we all talk about so much. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say, I think mean, simply put, um, looking at opportunities to uh, increase densities around the city, and I think expanding two-family zoning, expanding multifamily zoning is really important. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about centers and corridors. If we're going to continue with that strategy, we have to see, you know, some significant uh, densities occurring around those centers and corridors, I believe. So anything we can do to, uh, to make that possible, uh, I think, is, is really, really important, along with ADUs and, and all the other tools that we've been talking about. Um, you know, more development, especially small lot development, is going to do, I think, wonders for our, our housing inventory problem. Council President. Yeah, somewhat similar. Um, you know, when I first heard about centers and corridors, I, I imagined that, you know, major arterials were generally corridors. And then I found out that is not the case. There's only a few corridors out there. And so as we get better and better transit, I'm I'm hoping that we'll figure out a way to, you know, we won't call them corridors, but add transit more transit oriented development not just within the currently designated corridors so that we can do something if there's regular transit stops we can have some mixed use i mean i'm just thinking of my i live near grand and there are some mixed use things on grand but it seems like along those corridors where there's very frequent bus service there should be mixed use and then there should be at least a half a block on either side with townhouses and duplexes and things like Councilmember Cathcart so that we could just have those areas around the city that don't invade the core of single family neighborhoods but provide businesses and density where there is transit because originally if I understand the center and corridor uh, concept it was because there would be transit there so we wanted to densify I just think with increased transit we need to come up with maybe another term that allows us to do the same thing appropriately. And I'm not sure what that is, and not sure that we're gonna get that on the 2021 plan, but I'm just looking for help down the road to better define that into planner speak. So. Thank you, Council President. And Lewis, as, as Brian brought up, I the um, mixed use along Corridor, et cetera, for corridors, I think of North Monroe, and um, you know, we've talked about that before. Um, so that is interesting to me, and also the ADUs. I think as we continue to have those discussions, that's, that's something that we can expand on. Okay, anybody else want to add their comments, concerns? Lewis, do you have anything else? Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. And we're gonna to go to Marlene Feist, and she's gonna give us an update on TDS Telecom. Good afternoon, Council. Actually, I'm going to introduce Josh Worrell, who is from TDS. Um, Josh is on the meeting. I'm gonna, I'm assuming he'll 
Here it comes. He's coming unmuted, and he's going to give us an update on how work has been progressing to uh, expand TDS's footprint in Spokane. Remember, Council approved the cable franchise with TDS about a year ago now, so good time for an update. Go ahead, Josh. Can you hear me okay? We can. Marlene, can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Thank you. And before I get going, um, did does anybody need an introduction to TDS? I do not want to speak too long here. I'm sensitive to your guys' time, but I don't want to jump right in. Is everybody familiar here with TDS Telecom? Uh, Josh, you might want to just do a quick brief um, overview and then get into the meat of the discussion. Absolutely. Um, so TDS Telecom is a Fortune 1000 company. We've been in business, the telecom industry, for over 50 years. Um, we started as a small rural telephone company trying to bring phone to rural areas of the country. As a result, we serve a lot of rural areas of the country, and we're in 34 states. Um, and we also own some cable systems in about six other states. So we're the seventh largest ILEC provider. ILEC is incumbent local exchange carrier. That's just the legal designation for the phone company. Um, so there's while seventh sounds relatively impressive, there's a fairly big discrepancy between us at number seven and AT&T at number one. So in the telecom world, we're fairly small, um, but we're continuing to grow. In 2016, we started our out-of-territory fiber um, program in which we basically went to a community, uh, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, is a suburb of Madison, that we've never offered service in, zero brand recognition, they don't know who we are, and we overbuilt the municipal limits within 15 months with fiber to offer a competitive choice for TV, phone, and internet service. Um, that was a giant success. And on the heels of that, uh, contributed about a billion dollars over a five-year period for us to continue those fiber builds in other areas of the country, similar to some prairies. So we look for areas that are growing, have high demographics, good household growth, um, and high-tech adoption agency, and we feel that they are underserved by their incumbent providers. And we go to those communities, and we overbuild them with fiber to offer a competitive choice. And that's what brings us to Spokane and um, executing the cable franchise. Are there any questions before I jump into the, the brief update I have for you today? I think you can go ahead, Josh. Oh. Okay, perfect. So to date... Um, the franchise was executed about a year ago. Our first permit was approved on August 14th. We started construction, or we put the date in the franchise as September 1st, um, and we've been working since then. So to date, we have placed 23 and a half miles of conduit, and we have pulled 15 and a half miles of fiber. We have completed construction in CFN neighborhoods. Um, DFN is just an internal designation that we use for po the polygon in which the construction is taking place in. And that those six DFN can contain 1,180 service addresses. And those addresses are going to be launched mid-April. I believe we're targeting April 15th. We will then continue construction in parallel with that. And we have um, scheduled launches every month for the rest of the remaining of the year. And I Pretty sure for the next three or four years until the, the city is, is complete. Um, as far as demand and registrations, um, we've received about a thousand registrations thus far for service. How does that compare to other markets? Um, it's a little low, uh, but we've had obviously COVID issues as everybody has. Uh, we have not been able to utilize our door-to-door -door team in the city of Spokane for obvious reasons. Um, and so as we continue to progress through um, the pandemic and our door-to-door -door team gets involved and we continue our marketing and branding, we expect to see that demand to continue to go up. This is reference a couple of months ago um, to your neighbors to the east in Coeur d'Alene. We just surpassed 10,000 registrations in that market. It took about a year and a half to get there or so once we started marketing. So it will pick up as we continue. But we're, uh, we're happy with the results we have seen thus far. On the, for the, what we expect the rest of the year, on the high end, we expect hopefully to deliver about 15,000 service addresses. On the low end, depending on how construction goes, 
probably around 4,000. So somewhere in that range is what we're anticipating. And there's a wide range of why we would miss by that many or gain by that many. It just depends on how construction proceeds throughout the summer as we continue to ramp up. Um, as far as how the construction is proceeding, as far as I know, and maybe someone from Public Works can chime in here, we've only had two major mishaps, uh, two major water main strikes, and then one small gas line was also hit, I believe, about a week ago. Those were stored, I believe, in a timely manner, um, and we're continuing to work closely with the officials. And we've also implemented, a, implemented an internal triage team in which our 1-800 number goes directly to our internal call center to a group that can open UTS tickets for any construction-related issues and then work them to resolution. We've also continued to try throughout the year to be a good community partner. So to date, we've sponsored or made charitable donations in the amount of $100,000 throughout different businesses and activities throughout the city of Spokane, and that number will continue to go up. We are very close to executing an agreement with the Parks and Rec Department of the City of Spokane for uh, a sponsorship. So we'll continue to make some charitable donations and city sponsorships to um, help, uh, excuse me, uh, build our brand and be a good partner for the city. Um, that is about all I have for you today, but I am happy to answer any questions or, or cover anything I may have overlooked. Does anybody have questions? Council Member Wilkerson. Uh, th thank you for that. I'm just uh, inquiring as you're building out in your partnership with the parks, we have talked a lot about uh, connectivity in our parks. So I just want to make sure that that's on your radar, that that is pretty important to our citizens, um, like they have connectivity in riverfront parks. We are trying to expand that to all of our parks just to level our playing field and equity across our city. So when you're looking at that, please keep that on your radar. And council member, we can, I'll, I'm taking a note of that and we can certainly meet with um, your internal folks about that. When you say um, you're looking for service there, are you looking for a fiber access point for Wi-Fi during events, or what particularly would you be looking to utilize we're, fiber for in those locations? For internet connectivity, just in our parks. If you go to Riverfront Park, you can log on and get access. It's close to the library, so it's kind of been a partnership with the library on some level, but we would like to expand that. And so since you're building, uh, we might as well get it on the ground level. And I certainly love to talk, and, and I shared this with Garrett, so I sort of love a conversation about what we're trying to envision that to look like for the whole city of Spokane. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And we can, we can have breakout sessions to discuss that. Um, it's, it's a lot of what the city wants to do. Are they looking for a public Wi-Fi offering from TDS or are they just looking for the infrastructure so they can provide their own city Wi-Fi? Um, and a lot of that depends on, uh, what direction you guys determine you want to go. Council Member Kepkart. Yeah, thank you uh, for the, the update. I'm just kind of curious if you guys could, if you could speak a little bit about how you go about communicating with, um, with the folks where you're, you're uh, laying the infrastructure. I know early on there were a few complaints. I haven't seen anything in, in quite a while. Uh, but but early on, there were a few complaints from folks. And so I'm just kind of curious what that process looks like uh, in case we do get more questions, just so folks understand what's happening, where it's happening, and, and kind of what, what it's going to look like when you're all done. Sure, absolutely. I'm going to try to share my screen here. I'm not sure if it's going to work. Let me know when you can see me. We can yeah, see it. See it. Okay, so so here is our tactics for notification 
in residential areas, and we do something similar for commercial. Um, so 30 days prior to start of construction, and this depends on when we get our permits approved and not, we try to coordinate closely with the city. So this is in an ideal situation, what we would have happen. 30 days out, they get a letter. 12 days prior to start of construction, they get a postcard. Five days out, our contractors put a door hanger on their door, and three days out, they'll get a little yard sign. And then throughout construction, outside of the neighborhood, we have a sandwich board in which contains all of our contact information. And here's a picture of the letter that they'll get. It has some commonly asked questions. It will push them back to our website, which also has a construction portion that will educate them on what public utility easements are, what we're doing there, why we're doing it, et cetera. This is the postcard. Um, it is specifically branded ugly black and yellow so that they will not throw it away. Inevitably, people will throw it away. Um, but we do mail this to each individual address prior to construction. And again, it has information on there about why they should call us um, if they have any questions or concerns. The door hanger is similar. Um, it just the same as the postcard, but it'll go on their door a um, little bit closer to construction. And then this is just an example of the tiny little like ADT door signs that we'll put our yard signs that we'll put outside. Similar information if they need, if they have questions, they can call the 1-800 number um, and we can take care of it from there. And then sandwich boards, of course. So does that help answer your question? Yeah. And, and if you guys, uh, um, you know, end up tearing up kind of the, the front yard of someone's home, you know, because it's in the right of way and that's where you have to lay the line. I'm just curious, what, what's your procedure for, for how you leave that when you're done? Yep. So it will be in some cases messy when we leave. Generally speaking, there is a restoration crew that comes in roughly anywhere from five to 14 days after construction to do restoration. It's a separate crew. Um, so there will be a little bit of a delay. And then of course, as we're coming out of winter, um, generally speaking, we wait till May to start any, any restoration. That's just because of dirt availability, et cetera, letting the ground thaw. So it get messy if we continue to dig up during the wet season. Um, but generally there will be a delay. We'll work, work closely with the city staff. Um, restoration is our number one issue throughout these projects all the time. Pretty much all of our calls are related to restoration. Where are you? When are you coming back? Uh, we will eventually get everything fixed. Um, sometimes we miss stuff. We'll raise our hand. We'll go back and get it done. Great. Okay. I, I really appreciate that information. Thank you. Hey, Josh, this Absolutely. is Karen. In terms of the restoration portion, is any of what you just said in the public information that you're putting out to folks that says, you know, if, if, if by chance we have to do this and this in your yard, we, we do have a restoration. Do we do anything to let them know that that's a, you're not going to leave them alone, that that's a, that'll be provided? I believe that is one of the frequently asked questions. I will check on that just to verify. But yes, on our when we push everybody to tdsfiber.com and the construction portion, we deal, we address the restoration issue. Um, and then, of course, if you call the 1-800 number, they'll answer any other questions in detail about restoration. If customers have or residents have specific questions about their yard, um, they can generally call the 1-800 number and they'll eventually get to the contractor and set up a site survey if needed. Some customers have very specific needs. Um, if, if they just need to call in and set up an appointment. That's great. Thank you. Uh, can I go ahead? Yep. Just, Josh, I just wondered what everyone wants to know is what neighborhoods are you in? Which ones are coming? Do, can you, do you have any general, without making any promises, of what parts of town you're actually working in right now? Yes, let me try sharing my screen again. And apologies on, there's usually a map up. Um, I didn't want to get too deep into it, but our engineering is not as far along as we would like because we ran into easement issues throughout um, town as far as what is considered a power easement and what's a utility easement. And so we had to do a lot of redesigning. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yep. 
So this is the, the build area. Everything you see in yellow is what we intend to build today. Um, these bigger polygons here that you'll see down here are node areas. So those are areas that have not been um, detailed engineered yet. These polygons are going to be served by one node, and they'll be broken down into smaller polygons when construction is ready. So these areas here and here, as you can see, they have numbers associated with them, uh, like B09. That is a DFN. Those are the areas that we are currently targeting and doing construction in right now. Great. We will That's work our helpful. way through here, and I believe we're coming Great. back. I'm sorry, did I miss that? I just said that's helpful to see that map, but continue on. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 not at all. Sorry. We will start in these areas. We're going to work back to the east and eventually start working our way south. That is very helpful, Josh. Does anybody else have any comments or questions before we move on? Perfect. Okay, Josh, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much, and Marlene, thanks so much for the update and the information. And I um, am assuming we will have another update down the road. So we will, we will see you then. And next up is Melissa Morrison on the Housing Subcommittee. Hi there. I'm going to share my screen. So I just wanted to update council members on the Housing Action Subcommittee resolution that we've talked about a bit, um, but as we're moving forward, um, I did send out a copy of the resolution on Friday and did receive a couple comments back. So I incorporated those comments in red in the later slides, um, but I just wanted to have a chance for discussion. Um, if council members have any questions or, or feedback they'd like to provide um, today. Um, so just jumping in is just the first section of the resolution that I sent out um, of kind of the overall purpose of this um, and how it relates to the housing goals in um, the comprehensive plan. Um, the second section is just forming the ad hoc housing action subcommittee underneath the city council's urban experience committee. So it would be, sim it would be similar to the um, SAS under the PIES committee. So a similar structure to that, um, but, but housed under the Urban Experience Committee. Um, section three is the purposes of this um, Housing Action Subcommittee. And in red, you can see the changes um, that were recommended um, from the prior version that I sent out on Friday. So I just wanted um, to give chance, um, give council members a chance to take a look at um, that change and just see if there's any discussion or questions. Anybody have comments or questions? Okay. Um, and so this continues on with the, um, the different task and the purpose or the, what the, the group would be responsible for. Um, the fourth section were the name members. So we started at 12, um, but there's been a couple requests for adding additional named groups to this. Um, so now I guess I should have changed spelling out 12, but 14. Um, so adding builders and then a person representing the perspective of the community assembly, um, adding those um, as name members of the group. Um, right now, we're saying at least 14, but it would be up to council as they are appointing members or as the, the group forms um, to what the cap is. So we do not have a firm cap at this time. It's just at least having this perspective of the, the following stakeholders. Um, and if there's no questions. Um, That's Karen. I made this, maybe, oh. this may be a really stupid question. Is this mm -hmm. the committee that we talked about for overseeing the 1590 fund or is that, is that a different committee? So that would be one of the purposes of the housing action subcommittee is okay. to 
um, help make recommendations. Perfect. There is a different committee, the SHAG, the SHAG or the Spokane Housing Advisory Group, which would kind of be the technical group to stand up the framework okay. um, of how decisions are made. Okay. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Um, and so the final of the resolution was that it will be open public meetings and um, comply with all of that. So that's the, the resolution. If there's any questions or comments, um, I'll do my best to answer any of them. Um, Melissa. Uh, Council President, did you have something? I do. I have two things. One, I just wanted to follow up on Melissa's statement about the the technical group, that that's a time-bound committee that's going to be for maybe six or nine months and then it won't be there anymore and uh, the administration is helping to populate that group um, so that's one thing and then secondly Melissa I had meant to email this to you but um, on the language on the open public meetings and public records acts I just think you should I, I'd like to tweak the language just a little bit to say that it will comply with those and so you know, wouldn't necessarily do more than it has to, but just would comply with the rules as applicable because sometimes these groups do or don't. So just a tweak on that language, but I can talk to you later about that. Okay, I made a note of that, so great. Um, so this is just kind of a visual organizational chart of how, we're, um, how we've kind of discussed that the Housing Action Subcommittee would break out into work groups to really do some deep dives on issues relating to housing issues. Um, and the SHAG is kind of a, it's not a work group, it's kind of off to the side um, as a technical advisory group to the, the subcommittee. Um, so here's a little bit of a breakdown between the differences. So the SHAG is that time down technical group, um, six to seven month commitment, which the administration will take the lead on. And then the Housing Action Subcommittee is much more a longer um, a long-term group with um, providing recommendations up to council, not only on the funds and the oversight for the funds, but also kind of on housing is issues um, more broadly. So it's a much more broad group. Um, and then just some additional information on the differences of the two. Um, and then finally, kind of the work group is how we're foreseeing this is that, um, there will be an application process um, to be part of the Housing Action Subcommittee or to be on the SHAG, um, but we're also looking at work groups for folks that may not want to make the time commitment but are very interested in certain areas or subjects that they can certainly join a subgroup or, I mean, a work group um, to discuss, you know, those ideas that would be brought up to the subcommittee. Um, this was just my brainstorming on different areas that work groups could be focusing on around housing issues and then certain topics. So this is no way to say that it's, um, this is a definitive list of, of topics that the work groups could be focusing on or talking about, but just some um, different policies or strategies that people might have some interest in, in um, for making recommendations up to council. Um, and then finally, the application, um, we're hoping to open it tomorrow and it'll be open for 30 days um, for really trying to want to get um, community um, involvement and a, and a wide variety of stakeholders and community members to apply. Um, and so you should be hopefully seeing some applications and having some more conversations as we get, um, as that 30 day closes of people that might be interested in being part of this group. Um, one, one thing that I did want to bring up is something that has been a conversation in the community um, around this group is the idea of having stipends for community members who are participating. Um, so that was something I wanted to bring up to council members as, a, um, as an equity issue to try to involve more people that um, may have difficulty attending meetings um, outside of their work day. So. Melissa, it's Karen. How are we getting word out to the public for these applications and, you know, all of that information? So um, we have talked to a lot of the um, kind of the known 
you know, people within the affordable housing groups. Um, once the application is, is live, um, we'll be emailing and making sure that we're communicating with community centers and different agencies um, and sending them out, them out to people that we might want to um, make sure they're aware of. Uh, the affordable housing group also had a good idea of reaching out to the continuum of care board because they know of a lot of people that are in the community that have had lived experience um, that might be interested. And so making sure that we're using all our channels um, to invite people to apply um, to the group. And so Lisa and I have had conversations about, about um, the outreach and um, making sure that we're making this widely known um, in the community. Perfect, thank you. Who has questions? Councilmember Cathcart. Do we, are, are there now, or, or I guess have there ever been committees where we paid volunteers to sit on those committees? I, I, I feel like that's a pretty slippery slope um, and I'm not sure kind of where, where that will, would, would end if that's the, the practice that we start. So that, that'd be a concern of mine. I, I have a, a, like not necessarily a response to that, but just an idea that this would be more of a stipend. It's not a payment to them. So it might be a stipend for their travel, for their time to like get to the meetings, things like that. So just to make it more equitable because not everybody can just volunteer their time for free and they don't have resources to um, travel to and from. So, um, you know, I'm kind of in conversations with folks to see if we can start a grant program where people could apply to get stipends uh, uh, to have a payment back for some of the um, effort that they're putting into like getting to the meetings and food and compensation like that. So. So would it apply to the entire work group, all participants or just a selected uh, folks on the, in the work group? I think it, I think it could actually even expand to all of our um, boards and commissions at the city if we can get it working properly, but it would be an application process. And there would be like certain qualifications that would, you know, let you get into the, so maybe there's an income requirement, maybe there's those type of things, just as it would be for getting onto any sort of other program. Again, I also don't know the like, legality of it, which I think Brian is leaning in, like maybe there's something wrong with that, but that's just, this has just been kind of a brainstorm thought that I've been thinking of. And um, anyway, Brian's going to say something. Go ahead, Brian. Brian. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cathcart, I also had kind of thought about that same issue as well, but historically um, city members of boards and commissions have had their parking expenses paid, their their um, conference attendance fees paid and such like that. So there is some kind of a history for helping people defray the costs of participating in boards and commissions in other contexts. Well, I'm, I'm happy to keep an open mind on, on the idea, but, but I feel like there's plenty of people who want to volunteer and help improve the community. And, and so I just feel like if we start, I guess, doing stipends or payments, it, it just could maybe not create the best system in my mind. But I'm, I'll keep an open mind and read any other data that comes forward. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. I just, you know, really quickly wanted to mention that, you know, when we're asking for people with lived experiences or people who have um, gone through a lot of things. It's difficult to invite them into a place where typically they haven't been welcomed and also we're going to ask them to continue to relive their trauma with us uh, so that we can have better policies. And I think we just need to really think about that and figure out how we're going to be equitable about it. Rather, I just don't want to, I just don't want to use people with lived experiences to come in and not have an opportunity to get anything back from it. Um, and so how do we work with our community to make sure we're getting those voices heard, but we're not, um, you know, causing any harm, so. Brian? Yeah, this, this is a really good conversation, and I think we need to broaden it beyond just this particular subcommittee. Um, uh, people have already kind of made the point, but there are some people that, just given their economic situation, or they might actually have an employer that pays them to attend meetings and things like that, it's a lot easier for them uh, than other people. And so uh, I think some community, well, I know communities are looking at this, but I think we need a broader policy. Uh, but it really could make a difference, as uh, Councilmember Burke mentioned. Uh, it might be the money to park, it might be bus fare, 
It might be mileage. It might be child care. A lot of times I would imagine that, that someone would need child care to attend a meeting. Um, so how do we figure out, without just saying everybody's on the board and commission uh, gets a stipend payment, or is it if you're not there as part of your work? I'm not sure. There's probably 100 details to figure out, and I'm hoping Alex can help us maybe uh, approach the conversation broadly, uh, and then we could start applying it to individual committees and uh, boards and commissions. So really good conversation. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa, and thanks for the good conversation, and thank you for all of your hard work on this. Let's go to the 2021 Aquatics Plan. Garrett, Jennifer, and Josh, are you with us? Yes, good afternoon, Council. We got the whole parks team with us. Uh, thanks for taking the time for us to give you an update on aquatics. And um, I'm going to ask Josh if he could share his screen and we could get the presentation up, but I'll hand it off here shortly. But I just want to give a quick overview of really where we're at and uh, where we can go. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, we've been thinking about alternatives to our aquatics plan for almost a year now. Unfortunately, we weren't able to um, operate our aquatics programs under the phase two uh, last season. But, um, you know, our team's always thinking positive. How do we can continue to move forward? And this team truly believes that aquatics is an essential function to this community, not only from a, a physical health, but just emotional as well. Communities getting together, neighborhoods getting together in a safe way. And so where we're at today is under the phase two guidelines and phase one um, is, the, is the same for aquatics. So we have the ability to be able to operate our aquatics at a limited capacity and service that Josh and Jennifer will get into. Um, now, you know, historically, um, how do we fund aquatics? And a lot of that funding comes from our program revenues outside of our general fund contribution. So our general fund contribution is that core service. And then it's those other type of fee-based programs that help support our aquatics program. And, you know, still with last year and then the beginning of the first quarter of this year, we still have been in that kind of limited program revenue capacity. So rather than, you know, giving up, we've come up with a couple options. And um, if you remember, too, from last year um, in the budget process and, and so graciously working with the council, um, you identified the aquatics being one of those budget priorities. Um, so when that time come, we would come back and just kind of present to you where we're, where we're headed. And so that time has come. I mean, it's here at the beginning of March, but we're already thinking of what June is going to bring to us. And we're confident that we can provide a safe operations to our community. And I think that's the number one. It's working with our local and state officials and how do we provide the safe alternatives and being able to bring that normalcy back to our community. Um, I think the worst thing for us was to see those six aquatic centers empty during a 90 degree day last summer. So we don't want to get there. What we're going to show you today is a, a foundational service that is a baseline that shows you what we can consume right now within the parks fund of our core service model. And then it shows you an additional option, which we prefer, which is our goal, to be able to expand that level of service as much as we can to the community. And we'll show you some of those numbers as well. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce Jennifer Papich, our Director of uh, Recreation, and uh, Josh Oaks, our Recreation Supervisor, who oversees the aquatics program. And again, I got to tell you, I'm the luckiest director in the world because we have the best creative staff in the world. Um, this is like version number 19 and 20 that our staff has been working on, but we're always trying to think of the next best way to be able to provide aquatics back to this community and really be that, that sense of hope again for that, those summer months. So with that, Jen and Josh, take it away. Garrett, before Josh gets started, I just wanted to let you guys know the first couple slides that Josh is going to talk about are basically um, what kind of standards we're held to under the current guidelines. What we can do, what does reopening look like to give you kind of a, a picture, picture of kind of all the things that we have to work with in order to open successfully this summer. So Josh, thank you for presenting. Yeah. So uh, we did this reopening plan with the goal in mind of uh, the development of a coordinated and safe reopening strategy for our aquatic center facilities 
to provide an equitable space for all benefiting the emotional and physical health of our community in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, like Jennifer said, I'm going to tell you kind of what we can do right now with COVID restrictions. We are able to open. Uh, we do have some guidelines we have to follow. Um, we have that foundational service model that we want to show you, the, the thing that we can afford right now, what that looks like, uh, what the financial impact is of that, and then some opportunities we could possibly add to it. So right now, water recreation facility opening conditions, we need to follow a few uh, a few things that are a little bit different than normal. We need to develop a comprehensive strategy, uh, safety plan to include COVID-19 exposure control, mitigation, and recovery. Uh, our staff have already completed this and it's in the final stages of uh, its draft and we're, we're getting ready to kind of move forward with, with our safety plan. Uh, we need to make sure to ensure that there's uh, six feet minimum physical distancing at all times for all activities. That's for patrons and employees alike. Uh, people of the same household uh, can occupy the same area of the pool, but if you're not in the same household, we're going to ask people to spread out uh, and implement other prevention measures such as barriers uh, for sneeze blocks and uh, stuff like that that you've seen in grocery stores. Uh, we'll probably have to put out in the pools where social distancing isn't as easy to do. Uh, we'll have to continue with face covering, um, such as masks and cloth coverings are required at all the facilities at all times. Uh, face coverings can be removed when you're in the water or while you're maintaining six feet of physical distancing. And all the aquatic centers are going to need to be appointment only reservation based. Uh, this is a COVID restriction from Washington State. Uh, so that would be uh, open swim, that would be lap swim. People would need to make sure and do a reservation ahead of time. Um, and we would need to follow limited capacity restrictions, which right now would be a maximum of 50 people in the, in the facility at one time. That does not include our employees. So that's good, that's 50 patrons. And then there's some guidelines specific to the programming that we offer. Uh, so swimming lesson restrictions, we need to make sure that there's that six feet of physical distancing maintained throughout the swim lesson. Uh, we need to have instructors wear a face shield with a cloth attachment that goes underneath the face shield uh, if they need to provide close contact to a swimmer in the water, which we provide close contact to our levels one, two, and three swimmers. Uh, we need to limit time of close contact uh, to a max of five minutes for each student per lesson. And then we could also look at options for having parent support uh, in the pool while our instructor is up on the deck if we, if we need to do so. For lap swimming, right now for recreational lap swimming, we can have up to two people occupy a lane at a time. Uh, for competitive swim team practices, we can have two people in a lane, but we are permitted to have up to four people in a lane uh, for competitive swim team practice. No two, two swimmers are allowed to remain within six feet of each other during rest period. And uh, swim meets are currently allowed as long as we take extra precautions to hold these events. And then open swim. Open swim is uh, able to... Uh, go with these restrictions. We just need to make sure that we're staying within capacity restrictions. Um, we wouldn't be gridding off the sections of the pool and letting people, you know, reserve sections. It, it would be, they'd be free to move around the facility much like you would a grocery store. Uh, but with limited capacity, we would be able to make sure and ensure six feet of physical distancing throughout. And there would be that pre-registration required. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of information on splash pads. So splash pads are able to open uh, in phase one and phase two of Washington's reopening plan. Because of the way they're permitted through our regional health district, they are water recreation facilities. The same permit process applies to splash pads as does as our municipal pools. And so we have to follow the same guidelines for the splash pads. And so what that means is they have to be reservation based. We need to follow capacity maximum. Uh, there needs to be physical distancing. There needs to be face covering. They, there needs to be a sanitation schedule. And so with 17 splash pads throughout our system, 
Uh, these factors make it very difficult for us to operate splash pads. And so at this time, we're focusing our limited resources on pools for open swim, and we're uh, not recommending splash pads at this time unless things were to change for us. So you've heard about our uh, foundational service model approach, and uh, we developed an aquatics program plan based on our core service model, a program that Parks Fund can confidently support with no outside funding sources. And with Learn to Swim programs being a, pro a top priority, uh, the, the youth here in Spokane County have not had a swimming lesson in over a year unless they uh, knew somebody and did it in their backyard pool. And so making that one of our top priorities or our top priority. So this is a very high level of what our operations would look like in a season with this foundational service model. So we would have a preseason at Witter Aquatic Center, that's only Witter Aquatic Center. Um, and we would have that for the first three weeks and that gives us the opportunity to do uh, lap swimming and private swim team rentals. Also the ability to trade, uh, train our lifeguards for uh, the season coming up. And so that would take for three weeks. And then we would open up at the same time that we would normally uh, the Monday after school lets out for summer. And that first two weeks, we're, we're looking at phasing in our programming. And so for that first two weeks, we'd have uh, adult lap swimming and we'd have our swim team and we'd have our swim lessons. And then, uh, like I said, we'd phase in programming. So we'd phase in open swim, but we would still be focusing on adult lap swim, swim team and swim lessons. It would be for a six week period uh, instead of an eight week period, which would round out our 10 week season. So it, it would be condensed and we would be able to offer one hour of open swim per pool per week. And then we close out the end of the season with uh, postseason at Witter with lap swim, private swim team rentals. Um, you can see the pie chart on the right is uh, the frequency at what we would operate the pools for the programs that we would offer. So you can see that, like I said, our main priority is getting swim lessons and getting kids into learn to swim programming. So that's why you see a large percentage of swim lessons and we've got the lap swim and we've got the swim team. And then we're able to offer a little bit of open swim. I think it's important to mention too, um, that we would be uh, charging uh, for lap swim, but we would not be charging for open swim. So with our financials for this foundational service model, uh, we would be able to service a, almost 13,000 visitors in a season. Um, our staffing and operating costs would be a little over 387,000. Our potential gross revenue would be a little over 143,000. And so the parks fund investment would be 244,000. So uh, that's definitely a step above what we were able to offer last year. We didn't offer any pool access last year. So this is a, a large increase from last year, but um, we want to uh, have an approach to build onto this. This is what we can uh, provide, but additional program investments outside of the parks fund would allow for increased open swim time, uh, potentially a longer season. Like I said, we normally do an eight week regular season. The, the uh, foundational service model is for, or we normally do a 10 week season and this model was for an eight week season. And we could also increase maximum visitor capacity. So our ultimate goal, if you wanna, if you wanna see what our ultimate goal is, is this is that high level of program offering again. Um, with our ultimate goal of being still having that preseason where we're getting lap swim, private swim team rentals uh, in for the first few weeks at Witter Aquatic Center. And then our regular season kicks off. Kids are out of school and the pool opens up uh, on that Monday. And that would be dedicated to adult lap swim, swim team and swim lessons uh, for those first two, weeks, first two weeks. And then phasing in, um, um, for the next eight weeks, we'd be phasing in open swim. So three hours of afternoon open swim sessions, six days a week at all pools. 
uh, designated nap time because that is our most popular time for open swim is the afternoon time. And so looking at bringing that back, uh, three hours of afternoon open swim, six days a week at all pools. And those would be one hour reservable blocks. So if we're only allowed to have 50 people in a pool at a time, uh, we would have three reservable blocks in the afternoon where we would have 50 people come in for an hour and then have a transition period where we would get ready for the next 50. Um, and then also in the evening hours, we'd have two hours of evening open swim three days a week at all pools. And that would be until uh, the end of the season, right before school goes back in session. And then uh, Witter Aquatic Center would have those remaining weeks for uh, swim team and lap swim uh, for the postseason. So with our Aquatics 2021 department goal, uh, we would be able to serve over 57,000 in capacity. We would uh, have a staff and operating cost of a little bit over 628,000. Uh, we would potentially gross $202,000. And um, with a proposed parks fund investment of $200,000, $13,000 and a community investment of the same $213,000. So, uh, Jen, did you want to close us out here? Sure. Thanks, Jen, Jennifer, this is Karen. I just want to let everybody know I'm getting nudged that we're running short on time. So, if we can get through this real quickly, it'd be great. Absolutely. This is going to be really quick. I just wanted to thank Josh thank for all his work on this. And, you know, we are very aware that our foundational model, the one that we can do within the parks budget is uh, very bare bones. Um, it does focus on swim lessons, which is a priority for us. Um, and it is a scenario that we can do responsibly within our budget. But it's absolutely the second approach that Josh showed is our goal. We really want to expand opportunities for our community to get in the pool within the open swim arena there. And so we are going to be actively looking for funding sources for that. Hopefully each dollar that we get outside of our park budget will be able to build upon our foundational approach to offer more to our community. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Perfect. Josh, thank you. That was a that was a very good report. And Garrett and Jennifer, thank you. Does anybody have any quick questions? We can follow up um, later after the meeting if you have questions. I don't think Garrett minds if you send him a text or an email. Okay, great, thank you so much. I'm sorry we're running out of time. Council President, can you do the land acknowledgement resolution in a couple minutes? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll um, go quickly. We could talk about this uh, at another time, but over the last um, year, Several of us have been working on what a land acknowledgement might look like, given that City Hall is right on the historical land of the Spokane tribe. And so we um, worked with some tribal members and other people and came up with uh, some draft language and a resolution uh, on how we might use that. Uh, we shared that with uh, the chairwoman of the Spokane tribe, Carol Evans, and uh, she and the Tribal Council sent it back with their approval. And so we're looking in the next uh, few weeks to consider a resolution that would essentially adopt that language and we'd put it likely on our um, council packets. And then once a year, probably in April around Earth Day, we would read it out loud and invite um, the chair of the Spokane Tribe to give us a report on the state of the earth, land and water, and then potentially also uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, ask other um, uh, representatives of perhaps native ur urban Native Americans to come talk to us about the state of affairs for urban Native Americans, and then also request that the city consider appointing um, an official liaison to consult with tribes in the area so that that was there. So it's, uh, it's not really a budget issue at this point, uh, but it's a step forward. So if you have comments about the language or ideas about how to implement it, if you could get back with myself, Kara Odegaard, Alex Jibalisco, Councilmember Stratton or Wilkerson, we're all kind of uh, conspiring on that, trying to get that done in our first 100 days. 
Thank you very, very much. Any quick questions? I think just direct them to um, the folks that Rian mentioned. John Edmondson, you have been so patient. I'm going to turn it over to you and Kara Odegaard, if you can give us just a quick update on this exciting e-bike delivery program. Sure. Thank you, um, committee chair. Uh, I'm going to be short and just turn it over to John. I know he's prepared a few slides. Uh, I, I met John last year uh, as the Sustainability Action Subcommittee started to explore what was happening in our community around urban agriculture and food security. And when I found out about John's new initiative, uh, it highlights um, so many sustainability principles that I thought it was very exciting to share with council. So I'll turn it over to you, John. Are you able to share your screen or do you yeah. want me to? I'll give it a shot. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Kara. Happy to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and try to share a few slides here. So I'm working with Growing Neighbors, and our primary mission is to uh, help neighbors grow and share healthy food and relationships. So that's what we're up to. And the specific program that we're trying to share with you today is about delivering food uh, and gathering compost via bicycle. So I'm also working with Shadow Park Presbyterian Church and Northwest Harvest very closely. So this is an exciting new initiative. We're really not doing it on our own. Uh, there's all sorts of partners involved, which is our favorite part about it. We love to collaborate. We're not really trying to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> right. So food insecurity is on the rise. Many of us are experiencing this or are hearing about it. Uh, and it has at least doubled during the pandemic, possibly even more than that. So this is the core need that we're responding to. I'm involved with a few networks, including the Spokane County Food Security Coalition, uh, working together to deliver food. So we're finding that that's been a big need and a big barrier uh, for folks to get to the food that's already out there. There was a pilot program in December that served over 2,000 households in Spokane County. And those who responded to the survey said uh, they couldn't afford enough food or they couldn't access existing food distribution sites. They simply couldn't transport themselves. They were quarantined or they weren't physically able to get to the food. So yes, we want to feed people, but we're thinking about just the holistic health of our community. Seeing food as more of a gateway to additional care and community connections, uh, that's really the heart of everything that we do with Growing Neighbors is really connecting neighbors with each other. Uh, so for lasting care throughout their lives and lifestyles. All sorts of different partners that we're working with. The YMCA has been really great. I've also worked with the Y and been a member for a decade and really excited about ways to get members outside uh, and to stay active outdoors. And there's several other partners that we're working with, including the master composters. We're not worried at all about having enough food to deliver. Uh, we have several food, larger food distributors that we're working with, uh, as well as more localized food banks and all sorts of gardens. So there's 40 plus different urban farms or farmyards that we're working with with Growing Neighbors, as well as other community garden networks uh, and churches in Spokane that uh, have a heart and ability to really share lots of great uh, and often locally grown food. So here's the dream, uh, setting up various hubs around town, uh, which could be a food bank, could be a church, could even be a farmer's market, and volunteer bike riders would show up to this hub. They would load up their trailers, bags, uh, cargo, whatever they have to offer. And initially we would want to rely on the equipment that the volunteers already have, if at all possible, uh, while also building up our own small fleet of bike trailers and potentially e-bikes to help with areas that are more hilly or more difficult terrain. So once we set up some of these hubs, and have some volunteers uh, able to help. 
oops, I think I missed a slide, uh, will give them a route. And along their route, uh, they may also pass by uh, some of these community gardens that we're already working with. Uh, we were already planting seeds in this picture last week, uh, and all these gardens could have produce to offer along the way. These volunteers would also stop by little free pantries. So we're working closely with Caritas. Uh, we installed 12 more of these over the past couple of months, with six more in production right now with Youth Build, wanting to make food as accessible as possible, as locally as possible. So reducing barriers and making it available 24-7. This is a map showing some of the known little fruit pantries in Spokane right now. You can see there's a lot in kind of Northwest and West Central. Uh, we're wanting to expand in West Central, but also looking a lot at Northeast, working with the zone and Northeast Community Center, as well as other partners like Catholic Charities, looking at other areas. So as these volunteers are out on their bikes, not only will they deliver food, but potentially also pick up food scraps or compostable waste. We would leave a bucket, the homeowner would fill up their bucket and then have that replaced with an empty bucket the next week. And this compost would then be delivered to community composting sites, which hopefully in a perfect world would be right back where they started at that hub. And this is an image of community composting project. We would probably use pallet wood uh, to repurpose those materials and build these composting areas. So we really want to invite our community to live out these values, uh, inviting all sorts of partnership, transforming culture, <clears throat> thinking more about how our food system can become more resilient, equitable, sustainable, uh, and even reproducible for other cities to learn from what we're doing. We're really just getting started uh, and would love help in any way possible. Uh, even connecting us with others that you think would be interested, volunteering or donating anything you might have access to. Here's my contact info. Happy for you to reach out and love to respond to any questions that anyone might have at this time. John, I just want to say that um, you've been around for a while and you have worked your heart out, especially in Northwest and, and I appreciate all your efforts as I do know that the neighborhoods appreciate them as well. I'm so glad that you were here to share that information. I'm sorry that it got a little rushed. Does anybody have any quick questions for John? If you're interested in anything for your neighborhood or even to have him come give a presentation, please uh, contact him directly. He shows up, he works, and uh, he's done a great job. So um, thank you so much, John, and thank you, Kara, for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you. Any questions at all for John? Okay, Kate has offered to move her summer youth passes to our next meeting. Uh, so we'll go ahead and end it. We're at 3.05 and I guess we have to be off at 3.15. So we'll see everybody at 3.30 at um, our next meeting. Thanks everyone.